Hello, and welcome to the show Gold Squadron Gaze. It's the podcast where two Star Wars loving gays break down each episode of their favorite Star Wars TV shows while also being gay as hell. I'm your host, Bradley Brower. I'm your other host, Charles Rogers, and I am the proud owner of one of only 5,000 Stellan Geos lightsabers because I make poor financial decisions. <laughs> How do you feel? How do you feel being uh, one of 5,000? I feel special. I, bet I you feel do. lucky and blessed by the universe because they sold out on Shop Disney like immediately, right? You know what's funny is when you told me that you were going to go get it, I was like, oh, let me just look on the website and see what it looks like. And it was not there. It was yeah, completely sold out. Yeah. It's, well, because, so long story short, I'm not going to tell the whole story out of respect for some of the people that were involved in it. <laughs> However, long story short is I did find out that right now it's only available at Doc on Dars inside the park makes sense that might change but for right now because they only sold a limited number on shop disney right now it's only in doc on dars so the second day that we were at the park for my birthday uh my boyfriend and i got up he actually got me out of bed by being like you have to wake up otherwise you may not get the lightsaber and i popped out of bed immediately (laughs) right but we had to enter the park we entered via the monorail because you can take a monorail up and around into Tomorrowland. That's actually technically an entrance to the park. So we could bypass the crowd at 8.15 so I could run to Dock on Dars. And I run in through the door. There's only like two other people in the store at this point. I run in the door. I walk up to the lightsaber counter. And I'm so winded that all I can do is point down at the lightsaber and say <laughs> that. That thing right there. And the employees kind of looked at each other and one of them went, So you want to buy that? I was like, yes. <laughs> then we have to take it heavy. It is heavy. It comes in a big wooden box and it's made of metal. So we had to then cart that all the way back to the parking garage. Oh my God. To put it in the car because we weren't going to lug it around all day. And yes, I know that I could have waited all day to go and get it. It wasn't going anywhere. I wanted the story. Oh no, of course. I wanted that story to be able to tell on the show. And you also bought a Star Wars thing recently you were telling me about. I did, in honor of your birthday. I know you bought yourself a gift. I bought myself a gift for you. (laughs) As it Uh, should be. Because, you know, everybody who listens to the show knows that Charles loves the Lego Star Wars universe, especially the video game, uh, the Skywalker Saga. So... For Black Friday, I decided to buy the Skywalker Saga on my Switch because it was literally like 20 bucks. Like, I was like, this is worth it to me. Like, not $60. I've put over over 200 hours into this game. I've 100%ed it twice. So when Bradley was like, yeah, I bought Skywalker Saga, I was like, oh, hell yeah, this is going to be great. Well, before we get into the subject of today's episode, we do have a few segments. We haven't done segments in a while, Bradley. I know. It's like we're getting back to normal. Like we're It's like back slowly to the way things but were. surely we're returning to the way things were. Right. It is my pleasure to announce the return of what is easily our most popular segment on the show. The thing Charles fucked up. Okay, I'm ready for it. On the last episode of Burning Seas, I stated that King Lee Char comes back in Star Wars 2020. That is wrong. That arc occurred in Star Wars 2015. The difference is 2015 takes place between A New Hope and Empire Strikes Back, whereas 2020 is currently taking place between Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. So... That was a misspeak on my part. I knew the right thing. I just said 2020 for some reason. That's on me. Anyway, some news also. Okay, so we were supposed to record yesterday. For context, we're recording this on November 21st. Yesterday, November 20th, was my birthday. And I got too busy to actually record. And it's a good thing, too, that we waited until today because we got some news, Bradley. (laughs) I love that. A couple pieces of news dropped today. There was a Vanity Fair article, and most of it was like a a piece with Hayden Christensen and Rosario Dawson and Dave Filoni talking about 
about the Ahsoka show, which is really cool, which is a really interesting read. There was some news in there. Dave Filoni, apparently, he used to be an executive creative officer. He's now the chief creative officer at Lucasfilm. And he will now be involved with basically all of the visual media going forward, kind of overseeing. I don't like the word overseeing because it implies that he has like power over it. But the way he described it in the article was he's more like guiding people. Right. He's he said just the, something along the lines that he's like the Jedi Council. Like, if yeah. You, yeah. <laughs> if yeah. you have a problem, come to him. Right. That he's just sort of guiding, but he's not really. So a lot of people, I think, are misinterpreting it as like, oh, he's going to be like directly managing all the. Pro no, that, that wasn't the sense I got from the article. Also, Ooh, they're right. giving more responsibility to Carrie Beck, who's a longtime producer. And that's interesting to me as well. Carrie Beck's produced a number of the animated shows. I didn't Google exactly which ones. Got it. But so that's that's interesting. I think Dave Filoni works really well in a supervisory role. I think that he I think so. very he very much has a grasp on what George Lucas was doing, and he's really good at like overall like managing large scale projects creative. So right. I'm, I'm I'm feeling good about this. I I think that's good. And really, they did desperately need somebody like James Gunning, that shit, somebody no, overseeing. Sure. Yeah, because you don't want, I think the problem before is what you don't want is you don't want one person helming the ship and then being like, okay, I'm going to make another ship and I'm going to make another ship and I'm going to make another ship and I'm going to make another ship. And it's like, well, okay, that's too many like things that you're doing, too many balls that you're juggling versus here, let's bring in a bunch of different creative people to make different projects and then just have this one guy who's really good at the lore and everything you know revolving the universe to kind of oversee things that's a right. different role you know what i mean like it's not the same so i think yeah. it's definitely better i think what a lot of toxic fanboys wanted was they wanted dave filoni to come in and personally run everything forever so that he would get rid of all of those pesky women and gay people and not white yeah. people that were in the star wars which i'm not sure where they got that idea <laughs> i was like have where... you never seen a dave filoni project before like I'm confused. I mean, yeah. but it seemed more like like it, it also seemed like they were sort of gearing up to bring in a new generation because yeah. it talked about like Carrie Beck was going to be one of her new major things that she was going to be doing was trying to bring in new talent and new people. So it seems like they're trying to set up like more generations of Star Wars storytellers. And then Dave Filoni is going to be kind of guiding the entire process creatively and kind of sure. teaching people the way that George Lucas taught him. He's right. going to be passing that down to his own apprentices, uh, the way that George Lucas taught him, the way that John Favreau taught him with the live action uh and i have a, a sort of tinfoil hat theory that maybe carrie beck might be being eyeballed to replace uh kathleen kennedy when she retires oh interesting that's it's that's a tinfoil hat theory i have but i'm not sure and she will be retiring shitty toxic fanboys when she leaves it will be because she wants to because she has had a stellar career and she would like to go and relax with all of her giant piles of money that she has and not because <laughs> there was some secret civil war helmed by whatever white man of the day you've attached yourself to within lucasfilm sorry to reality check this for you speaking of women in things we also today got a little tidbit from Daisy Ridley about the Ray Skywalker movie, Ooh. which wasn't a lot, but was interesting. She said she hasn't seen a script, but she knows what the story is. And she says that it wasn't what she was expecting, but she really liked it. I mean, she also it's, said she it's doesn't a bite. know when it's, it's happening. A bite. It's a, it's a bite. bite. It's yeah, something. It's a little something to chew on. She also said she didn't really know when it's happening. And that was the other thing, too, with the Dave Filoni article is Rosario Dawson had some comment. Basically, like, they were gearing. She didn't outwardly say they were gearing up for a second season, but, like, they were gearing up for they a second season. They were gearing up for a second season, right. <laughs> and, like, oh, well, she's not sure what's going to happen now because of the strikes, yada, yada, yada. And I'm like... Okay, they're, they're going to do a second season. They just, they haven't officially confirmed it yet. Of course, yeah. But it was interesting that Daisy also now got to go to the press and say, I've seen the Ray Skywalker movie story and I really like it. I like that. I like that she's 
she's at least she's involved in the process to an extent like they're not like keeping her in the dark or whatever so much so that she just genuinely has nothing good to say or anything at all at least with this like she's like okay they at least told me what the fucking story is like it's not like now that's all subject to change and scripts will definitely change and they probably are writing the script or they're kind of either editing the script or doing something with the writing process now uh, that they couldn't do before because of the strikes so now right. it's kind of like they can really gear up you know with the script writing process Process. And I think she's like, okay, I know what the prompt is. <laughs> I don't know when or what. Is I know the little happening. blurb right. Right. that's at the top. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, most people don't remember this because I don't hear this talked about, but Pepperidge Farm remembers. But they released a couple month or two into the writer's strike. They released an updated slate of when the Star Wars films are going to come out. And they had to push, they now, at least as far as I had heard, they had pushed two of them onto the same year. I think originally one was supposed to be 2025, then 2027, 2029. And then that became two films in 2027. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, that's probably the Ray movie. And it probably got pushed because the script wasn't done. There was an interview with Stephen Knight that's like, yeah, we've got like, or no, it was Kathleen Kennedy, either you Kathleen Kennedy or Stephen Knight that was like, oh, we have six more months of, or six more weeks of writing on this that we estimate. And like two weeks later, the writer strike happened. I'm just happy they're doing films again. I'm happy that they seem to be scaling back the TV a little bit. Anyway, speaking of, uh, I don't know how to segue this. Speaking well, of Star Wars. <laughs> Speaking of Star Wars, <laughs> we have been covering for the last couple of weeks Darth Vader's 2017 run. Uh, we are finishing that up before we return to our visual media in the new year. And so we are now in the final arc, Fortress Vader, which I'm very excited about. <laughs> <laughs> And today we are going to be covering issues 19, 20, and 21. Bear with me on these credits because it's kind of a little annoying. So the writer on this is Charles Soule, as always. Penciler, Giuseppe Camicoli, as always. The inker was Danielle Orlandini for the entire thing. Here's where it gets complicated. Because issues 19 and 21, the letterer was Joe Caramagna. Except on issue 20, the letter was Travis Lanham. Colorist is in the same situation because David Curiel is the colorist for 19 and 21. And 20, the colorists are two people, Dono Sanchez Almara and Eric Arseniega. Arseniega. Sounds right. There we go. Uh, apologies if I butchered that last name. But those are who our, who our colorist is. So they switch letters and colorists like randomly in the middle of this. I don't know what happened there. I'm sure I will never find out. I'm sure there's not even a reason. It's just like, there's oh, probably you're doing this today. <laughs> I'm guessing it was probably crunch. I'm guessing it was probably yeah. they were trying to get these out. And so they had to have somebody come in and do a, a separate issue. And you want to keep your big guns for like the back part of this arc. Because really all the first two issues are is set up for why the entire rest of the arc happens. Yeah. And we'll get to those issues. So we are covering Fortress Vader parts one through three. This week on Darth Vader 2017, Darth Vader creates chaos on Coruscant and is promptly booted to his own planet. Bradley, what was one thing you liked about issues one through three and one thing you disliked? One thing I liked was I liked having read Inquisitor Rise of the Red Blade before this issue, comic <laughs> issue. Um, We're here! We're finally here! I've been waiting for this for weeks. I don't, I'm going to speak in broad terms until we get to like the actual scenes, but the i don't understand how you could have read this little i'll just say like 19 and 20 are kind of like a mini arc i i don't even know how you could have read this without all that context like the fact that the book gives so much more context to this tiny little story like this little tidbit in this like overall arc is so complex and it's just like so hilarious that like this didn't have this these characters didn't have any backstory for this little bit like the book enhances this so much i love that like I have that pre-knowledge, but I really liked those characters. I really liked that little bit uh, of uh, the Red Blade story. What I didn't like, there's not much I didn't like. I thought that the second or the third issue was a little like they relied a little bit too much on that whole mask thing that they were setting up. It makes more sense in the broader context later on, I think, but I, we'll, I just, we'll get to. Yeah, the mask. I didn't. Yeah, I didn't want to talk too much on it, but I didn't really quite. I feel like they set it up 
for the whole entire series and then they only introduced it in part three so i don't know it was kind of like a like we'll get, to, we we'll get to the mask and we'll get to what's going on with with that and sure. where we've seen it before in star wars we've kind of mentioned it uh, but i'll talk a little bit more about it yeah for me one thing i really like i really liked i'm gonna shamelessly rip off the divas again I really liked that we introduced a bunch of new characters uh, that were really compelling and interesting. And in particular, Colonel Bren in issue three, uh, issue 21, part three of this. Right. Uh, Colonel Bren in particular, I was like, oh, I fucking love this lady. I fucking love her. She is great. She is one of the most interesting characters I've seen in a Star Wars comic. One thing I didn't like uh, is that all of them die. Yeah. All of the interesting new characters we meet die immediately. And it doesn't really rub me the wrong way generally, but I do remember the context of when this came out. And Is Katakaris and Twalin are introduced literally here in Darth Vader number 19. They are dead by the end of 20. Then in issue 21, we have two new characters that are introduced. One of them is dead by the end of the issue, and the other one is maybe dead. I I don't remember exactly yeah, what happens to him at the yeah, end of the arc. Like, we'll get there when we get there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and that was one thing that did annoy me slightly. In retrospect, Iscat having her own book does dampen that. I wish we would see uh, Colonel Bren elsewhere. I think right. she would be interesting to see somewhere because I don't think she's turned up anywhere else. But that may end up being the thing Charles fucked up. Because it was the thing he didn't research and he is not Googling it now. We do not have the time for that. Um, I want to amend my thing I didn't like. Okay. Okay, so it does still have to do with the mask. Um, I didn't like how at the end of issue three that she, the architect lady, um, was not the one possessed by the mask for the rest of the issue. Oh, that would have been so cool. That would have made That would have been sense. so rad. I would have liked that more. I think that, that would have made... been so rad. Because they, they gave her like a thing and then they were like, oh the mask is the one that designed the fortress or something. And it's like, wait a minute, why wouldn't it just be her it, being possessed have done that? I don't know. It would have made more sense if that was it. So that's why I, 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 like. I do there agree with that. Okay, there you go. Okay, so we are on a planet. Wikipedia does not tell me what planet it is, so we are moving on. We are with Jedi Council member Eeth Koth. He is with his wife. His wife has just given birth to a baby girl. Darth Vader shows up and is like, I have brought you a baby shower gift. It is violence and death. Violence and death then ensues. Ethkoth fights Vader. Mira, who's Ethkoth's wife, runs off with the baby, pursued by, surprise, three Inquisitors. It's the fifth brother and Tualan and Iskatakaris from the Rise of the Red Blade novel. Yay, we made it. They pursue. The events of the Rise of the Red Blade novel happen. Iskatakaris catches up to Mira at the spaceport, initially lets her go, waits until the transport is about to take off and then like force pulls the baby back to her which is extremely messed up a vader waits until ethkos sees this and then fucking murders him meanwhile back in coruscant vader shows up he has a meeting with the grand inquisitor the grand inquisitor is like bro we're running out of jedi what the fuck vader does some weird meditation thing uh cut to the inquisitors having drinks vader shows up and ignites his lightsaber and that is where the issue ends of course, Vader picks the single most dramatic moment to enter the room. I can actually picture Vader standing outside while the, the birth is going on and waiting for it to be done. He's like, yeah, he's waiting for the crying of the baby, like right when it comes out. And he's like, OK, now he's just sitting outside with like his hands on his hips, just like, ah, come on. This is about me. This is about my dramatic in, in, entrance to the room. I just love that he he does that. I love just how much of a dramatic fucking queen Darth Vader is at all times. That's just so funny to me in these comics. Speaking of dramatic queens, Eeth Koth is like, I am a member of the Church of Ganthic Enlightenment. Do you know what else the Church of Ganthic Enlightenment has shown up in Bradley? Uh, I'm assuming the High Republic. Nope. Fucking nothing. Oh. Oh. Only ever mentioned here and nowhere else. So it's just this planet's random religion church. Thing. It's it it seems like a Unitarian type thing. You know those Unitarian churches where like you can go on and you can like sign up and it'll let you officiate weddings. Oh, I, I guess. Have you never heard of this? No. 
I didn't know that was a thing. I don't know if it's a Unitarian churches, but it's like some sort of unity church or something. Anyway, the whole like non-denominational, non-religious, the, the whole point is it's oh, basically okay. a shell that you can get like ordained from and it'll let you like officiate weddings. Ah, okay. I, yeah, like a wedding officiant.com or something. Yeah, something it's, it's yeah, like yeah. one of those things, but it'll get you ordained with this particular thing. I feel like the Ch Church of Ganthic Enlightenment is that. I see. I thought that too. Like when I when he was describing it, I was kind of like, oh, you just switched, you know, one religion for another. Basically, you were like, oh, this one's not working out. I'm just going to go do this other one. Like, well, Palpatine points this out later when he's being really shitty and bitchy. He's like, <laughs> well, I can't. He, he cannot be a Jedi. So he is right. going to do the most Jedi thing he possibly can. Right. What a stupid little bitch. <laughs> Isn't he so ridiculous? Let me swan about the literal Jedi temple. Come on, Palpatine. I like that Vader kind of tries to get, like, Eeth Koth to, like, slip to the dark side by being like, you have attachments now. Right. You could give in to your anger. You're fighting much better now that you're not bound by the Jedi. He's trying to get him to slip up. Right. Is what he's doing. He's taunting him. But one of the observers of that sequence has some thoughts on what Vader is saying to Eeth Koth. An observer named Iskatakaris. <laughs> who is also standing there love her we have three new inquisitors we have the fifth brother who we first saw in star wars rebels but we have also seen in obi-wan kenobi uh we saw him earlier in darth vader we've seen him in the battle scars novel you know who this guy is right. uh, and the other two are the 13th sister aka iscat and twalen yaluna he doesn't the, have a title, right? He doesn't have a title, apparently. I went looking, couldn't find it. Well, then I guess he's unofficially the 14th brother. He's the 14th brother. 13th it's around brother, the same 14th time brother, as his cat, so I guess it's, you know, close enough. Yeah, and he has, as far as I can tell, only appeared here and in Rise of the Red Blade. But I found it really interesting because I actually, like, while you were setting up to record, I went back and reread the epilogue. And I, f I read Iscat's whole bit because, like, Iscat lets uh, the wife go with the baby right. and then yanks the baby back and is like, well, she appealed to me woman to woman and person to person and now she'll never trust anyone again. And I went in to read uh, the epilogue to be like, why did Iscat do this? She's just being shitty for no reason. Right. Because like, if you look at it, if you if you didn't read the book and you just read this panel, you're like, oh, she's obviously an evil lady villain. Like she was just doing it to be evil. But then Vader gives the explanation later. He's like, nah, she shows weakness. I think I think that's in the next one, right? He's like, she shows so we'll, weakness. We'll talk about it in the she, next one. Yeah, but, let it go. But yeah. if you actually read the book. No, she just sucks. No. Yeah, like, she just sucks. <laughs> she just sucks. I love it. Like, that's she's, why she she's did so it. She's so jaded. Yeah, she's like, she's yeah, she's being a bitch. <laughs> I love it. She sees a chance to cause someone the same pain she was caused. And that's the thing about the dark side, right? That's the thing about selfish, selfishly dwelling on your own suffering. If you focus solely on your own suffering, you're going to get to a point where you are going to want to inflict that suffering on other people. You're going to become so bitter and so upset that you just want to lash out and hurt other people. And that's what she's doing here. She's just, she's so beaten down at this point and so deep in the hole that she's like, no, I got to cause somebody else the same pain that I've endured in my life. Okay, what the fuck? I love reading this after reading Rise of the Red Blade. I do want to shout out once again. Do you read this in dynamic view, Bradley, or do you just read the pages as they come? Just as they come. Just as they come. So if you read it in dynamic view, which I did, the bit where Eethkoth dies like he gets stabbed, really cool. So I do highly recommend reading this on dynamic view. Vader, did you catch that Vader refers to the child as an it? Bring yes. it to me. Bring it to me, right. Like it's not a person, like it's a thing that he was sent to retrieve. Yeah, and it was a little confusing because when he says like he he the baby's crying and he's like quiet and the baby just kind of like eyes get really big. I didn't quite understand what he was doing there because then it looks like he's carrying the baby like with the force, like when he gets to Coruscant, it looks like it's like just floating there. <laughs> it's like, I don't know if it's like supposed to be dead or asleep. No, it's alive. It's alive. I know, it's just like, confusing. She's alive rather. Right, right, right. Uh, she is alive. 
We will never see her again, by the way. Uh, neither her nor the mother pop up again in anything else. I checked. Yeah, that's that's also weird too, because like he hands the baby off to the weird, the things. worst fucking nannies I've ever seen in my yeah, life. They look the most horrifying. <laughs> they look like somebody had a nightmare about the Night Sisters of Dathomir and tried to redraw it in crayon, and right. it just looks fucked up. Those things are horrifying. Horrifying. They look terrible and gross but that being said i want to know what happens to this kid i also want to know what happens it makes no sense it's like there's nothing like they never talk about it again it's just like this kid palpatine has this secret daughter somewhere now and that's it well here's (laughs) the thing that this generation of star wars writers has realized kevin scott is the absolute best at it but charles soul is also very good at this they will seed things in that they clearly have no intention of following up on themselves right so that in the future someone can follow up on it that somebody may come along and pitch a story or del rey or dark horse or marvel or whoever might say we want to do a limited comic series or a novel about this one character is katakaris being a fantastic example she's right. given so much character just in these two issues with how she treats the mom and the kid and then the conversation she has with Twalin about like drinking the liquid that comes up again later in Rise of the Red Blade. And so when they went in and said, okay, we want to do a character, we want to do an Inquisitor character. Well, boom, there's a character right there who's kind of sort of developed already. And, and I, I wish that, that, I wish that they hadn't, I mean, spoiler alert, killed her in the next issue because I think that this would have been a good sequel to Red Blade. Like she comes across this child again at some point in her life and has to rectify what she did like you know what i mean like it's kind of like a some kind of she meets this kid and then she's like oh i have to reunite you with your mom or something just because that's just what i owe you because i ruined your life kind of thing like i don't know there's got to be some story there i just feel like there's something there that would be a good happy ending to the story but fuck you this is a star wars story (laughs) by charles of course Of course. Vader and the Grand Inquisitor have a meeting, basically reaffirming that they're running out of Jedi. Now, fortunately for me, there's a, a, I almost said shot. I cannot wait to go back to covering TV. Do this Because I keep saying words like shot and episode, because I'm used to doing Uh, that on this fucking podcast that we've been doing for almost three years now. (laughs) And I've had to adjust my entire vocal pattern. Vocabulary, yeah. There is a panel of Vader and the Grand Inquisitor looking at names in Orabesh. And luckily, unlike previous issues, Wikipedia does actually tell me what those names are. Nice. They are Yoda, Obi-Wan Kenobi, Coleman Cash, Apo Rancisis, and two people named Selrak Elos and Ka Moon Koli. Uh. So those last two, Selrak <laughs> Elos. Selrak Elos is just Charles Soule's name reversed. Ka Moon Koli is that just Kamen Koli. Yeah, I got that one pretty quick. The, the, <laughs> the artist who I like that. does all the art for this. I don't have to say as an interesting fun fact, Matt Martin, who's a member of the Lucasfilm story group, did confirm that both of these characters are not just Easter eggs. They do exist in the canon. A Project Harvester is mentioned. I don't know. So Project Harvester is first identified in Servants of the Empire, which is a really good book series. Have you, do you remember in Rebels, because you just watched Rebels again. Do you remember that first season plot thread about Zare Leonis in the Imperial Academy that's just kind of fucking dropped? after season one and they never bring it up again is that the one where he's like i gotta find my family he's gotta find my sister yeah yeah yeah. i'm trying to get in you know how that's never fucking brought up yeah yeah they just drop it completely (laughs) they wrote a whole book series about it Uh, jason fry wrote a whole four book and they're actually really good like okay they're basically a sports academy story that's set in the imperial academy it's absolutely kind of wild what jason fry got away with but for project harvester was first identified as such in that series and what it is is it's basically them gathering up force sensitive children to turn them into dark side servants right trying to like i guess supplant the inquisitorious like the inquisitorious are jedi hunters specifically project arbiter was supposed to train up a generation that was just dark side force users that would serve the emperor uh but it has also appeared in the ahsoka novel jedi fell in order a couple of episodes of star wars rebels the ones that we mentioned earlier uh dates all the way back to the children of the force episode of the clone wars 
Oh, where there's that that little Greedo baby yeah. and a Rodian yeah. baby, I should say. Yeah, that um, he's kidnapping all those children. Yeah, yeah, and it's yeah. really fucking bleak. Anyway, Iscat and Twalin are having a conversation, and Iscat's like, we said we'd drink something local from every place we Planet. kill a Jedi. Yeah. yeah, that was in the book. I remember. Yep. <laughs> also, the second sister out. is there, too. Is she? Yeah, there's a one shot of her in the... One panel. One... <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> There's one panel of her and then the, uh, what is it? The fifth brother and the sixth sister. Oh my God. There's so many. I love when I Bradley has to engage his brain, right? Because you, we you look think they at would each- label them all. <laughs> we look at each other so we can have visual cues. And when Bradley actually has to employ the use of his brain cells, his eyes kind of like flick up slightly into the back of his head while he's trying to remember it's very funny no nope, you're looking it up sister six sister G- give me give me a little more fifth a little more fourth fourth no fourth sister was in kenobi wait no the second what? sister's not second second sister's from fallen order second yeah. sister's from fallen order you might yeah, be that's thinking her helmet. Of the... no that's, that's her helmet. helmet um and then what's that one with the little flying droid holy shit you're fucking right. I know. I'm always You're right. You're fucking right. Oh, my God. <laughs> this was the she's first appearance in of there. the second sister. Yeah, she's just randomly there. And then, like, she's, she's not in any other panel. Like, she's literally just in that one panel and then, like, never seen again. Holy shit. Yeah, it's wild. Yeah, this is the first appearance of the second sister. Oh, fuck. But, I didn't even realize that she was there. Well, she likes drinks, too. She's chilling at the party. I was I was so focused on Iscat and Twalin that I completely missed her. Yeah. So the the is, rebels is Sarah, inquisitors are there, and then she's is Sarah Michelle there. Geller also there? Uh, Sarah Michelle Geller is there. The blue inquisitor that dies in Rebels randomly in that same scene. Second brother, whatever his name is, fifth brother. I don't know. The no, fifth, fifth brother, brother, fifth the brother, fifth brother the seventh sister, and the eighth brother are all in Rebels. The second sister is the main antagonist of Fallen Order. Okay, at this party with all the Inquisitors, the Rebels Inquisitors are all there, and then the second sister from Jedi Fallen Order is also there. Cool, and this is the first appearance of the second sister from Jedi Fallen Order. <laughs> yeah. We move on. End of issue. There you go. End of issue. Uh, Vader ignites his lightsaber. End of issue. Issue number 20. The Vader attempts to fucking kill Iscat. Twalin gets his lightsaber in the way. They both run away. A chase scene ensues. Some rich people get murdered. This is important. They wind up in a confrontation with Vader. Vader forces them to stab each other and they are dead. Palpatine is pissed about this because Vader keeps trashing his planet and killing people he needs to enact his evil plan because Vader has absolutely no regard for politics. He would rather just stab people. And so Palpatine is like, look, I get that I gave you the Inquisitorius. You keep blowing my shit up. So if you're going to blow my shit up, you're going to do it fucking somewhere else. I will give you a planet. Pick a planet. Also, here's Padme's ship for some reason. And he gives Vader a couple options and Vader's like, I want Mustafar. Give me fucking Mustafar because I'm an emo little bitch boy. Uh, <laughs> and end of issue. Yeah, this was uh, this was definitely like the book. Like this was uh, this was the book. Maybe not the last bit where he's with Palpatine, but like the rest of it is definitely the book. <laughs> it's it's the book. Uh, and I did reread the book, uh, just the epilogue to right. prepare for recording this episode. And yeah, it's it's the same down to the dialogue. Uh, it's literally exactly the same. There's a line in there about how their attachment is their weakness. And I'm like, hold on, hold on just a second. My understanding was that attachment being bad was a Jedi thing. Right. And Vader's constantly being told to lean into his attachments, lean into his grief, lean into his anger. Something does not compute here. Right. Also, if you are just reading the comics, where was there ever a hint that there's a connection between them other than Vader just saying in the one panel, I sensed a connection between you two. He says it in the one panel and then Twalin like blocking him with the lightsaber lightsaber, in the first place. I I understand that that, that's what Vader thinks is happening, but also it could just be he's just reacting. You know what I mean? Like he's just having a reaction to someone having their fucking lightsaber out and he's like, oh, defend, you know, kind of thing, because they're just drinking and having a good time. Now, I understand the actual backstory because I read the book. So clearly they have feelings for each other, but it's just random in this context because that wasn't written yet. So I need to know from Charles Soule, what was his intentions here? Because it doesn't it does not compute in my brain. I, I wonder if it's a sort of 
Yeah, I wonder if it's like Vader wants to keep that attachment thing from the Inquisitors. Like, there's a long tradition of Darksiders hiding knowledge from each other. He doesn't want them to become powerful, and he knows that leaning into attachments will make them more powerful. So he's being like, oh, they've got attachments that I that theoretically they could draw power from. Mm, right. We can't be having that. We can't be having people form opinions outside of me. Because the thing is with like with dark side things and also with like a lot of movements in general like this, the people at the top will say something. They don't really mean it. Right. He'll say it's just a way to keep controlling their followers. They expect their followers to adhere to what they say. They're not going to adhere to it themselves. And that's the whole thing with the dark side. Like, anytime somebody tries to portray the dark side in any sort of positive or even neutral light, I'm just like, mm, 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 because everything about it is twisted. Everything about it is wrong. Everything about it is contradictory and doesn't make any sense. That's the point of it. It's bad. It's not good. You shouldn't want to do it. The Grey Jedi are bullshit. Moving on. We get a panel of Vader, like, riding with two of his, <laughs> two of his troops. Did you see how he's standing in this why? thing? Why? First of all, why is he standing? That can't be He's safe. standing. For so starters, he, he's standing. For starters, he's standing. Also, he has to be using the force to balance himself on that speeder, because there's just no fucking way that he is standing on the backseat of this speeder, literally while they're driving, and then is balanced. Like, it's just like, it doesn't make any sense. He's just, like, perfectly standing. And then the best part is where they start throwing the speeders at him, which, again, I've read the book. I know that that's what they do. However, I just found this scene so funny for no reason and iconic because he's just standing there like a queen and then trying it's to dodge so funny speeders. it's great it's so funny and then a speeder drop there's like a scene where some rich people like and we we kind of know they're from naboo palpatine's gonna say it later but we kind of know because of the like the royal you can see the naboo guards around them oh okay. they're having That's like the a time. picnic yeah. in the park yeah and then a speeder just fucking drops on them um, and my notes I, literally I say R.I.P. Rich fucks. I cannot even. That was so stupid, but funny because I could I could picture it. It was giving me like if you've ever watched Avatar: The Last Airbender. Every time he destroys the cabbage cart, like that's what this is giving me. <laughs> it's the, the my of. cabbages, but it's fucking yes. senators that Vader right. keeps getting murdered, literally dying every time Vader's around. I just, just find that every so funny. time Vader's around. Oh god, that is so funny. Also, I can see why Palpatine's pissed because he's literally just destroying the city as he's hunting these people. oh yeah <laughs> like, oh yeah he's just fucking breaking they're everything. throwing speeders at each other like it's just iconic so they do eventually die r.i.p to iscatacharis vader is dragged in to go see his boss and he's like what the fuck happened and vader's like well she only took the kid back because the fifth brother saw her and i'm like i need to double check this yeah, no, that's why when I read that, I was like, wait, that's how that went in the book? Like, I was like, that doesn't make sense because that's not what I remember. I yeah, was like, he's so I went, I went back to the book and looked at it for myself. And no, it, she's just being evil. But like, he's using that like as an excuse to kill her, I guess. It's kind of more implied it has to do with her like forming attachments, but it's not really clear at this point. If anything, the book kind of makes it worse yeah and more and confusing it was, it was weird because he he kind of defends his decision a little bit to palpatine but then palpatine's kind of like uh was it really worth it though like i don't think so like you could just keep them in check like you didn't have to fucking go out of your way to try to murder these people right now because what you're just saying is all speculation at this point palpatine's like stop fucking blowing up my planet <laughs> for your petty stupid inquisitor bullshit Right. You may have forgotten that I'm the fucking emperor of the entire galaxy. Well, and he raises this good point, too. He's like, how can people, how can I be expected to run my empire if I can't even keep chaos away from my own palace? And right. he's like, I don't fucking know because I didn't think about this because I don't know what I'm doing. But also it's kind of on Palpatine because it's like you want your secret police force or whatever to like operate like under your rule, like on the on Coruscant. But then also it's like they're crazy. And so it's like, why don't you just keep them away <laughs> like you should have done in the first place? Well, Palpatine, sense. Palpatine also clearly doesn't care about the Inquisitorious. Right. He clearly doesn't care about people keeping them around. He's planning to dispose of them all anyway, even if they don't all fucking die, which the Inquisitorious has a pretty much 95% mortality rate. 
<laughs> right. Uh, one person manages to get away from them. Yeah. Shout out to Riva. Yeah, she's the only one so far that I that ain't canon wise that they have explained. So anyway, Palpatine's like, anyway, that's enough of that. Let's bitch about a guy I hate. <laughs> <laughs> he literally turns on a dime. He's like, anyway, we're done with that. Let's bitch about this Jedi. I love Palpatine. I think he's so funny in this. He leads Vader down and it's Padme's ship. Which I'm like, you saved that on purpose. You, like, he absolutely, <laughs> he absolutely requisitioned. And you know it's the Queen's yacht. It's not Padme's yacht. It's right. the Queen's yacht specifically. He went to Naboo. He sent people to Naboo and was like, yeah, I'll be taking the Queen's car now because I've decided. He clearly does not give a shit about Naboo, well, which we'll get to in a second. But first, I do want to point out that he tries to send Vader to Alderaan. Because yes. Bail Organa's being uppity. We were this close to Vader finding out about Leia. Right. Like, it's so funny how all the stuff that they keep hinting at or doing in these shows and stuff is always like, he almost finds out about Leia. Like, in the Kenobi show, it's like, almost like Leia's a thing. In this, it's like, almost went to go see her on Alderaan. Like, it's like, if he would have just been on the planet, he would have been like, oh shit, like, she, there's something here. Like, the child of Vader lives, you know, because he, as he, as far as he knows, is only one by kid, the, so. By the time she's an adult, and I do believe the first time, as far as I know, the first time she runs into him, like, physically in person, is on board the Tanavi 4. Right. During he a knows of her, but he doesn't, like, yeah. meet her. He knows yeah. who she is, but I think that might be the first time he's in the same room with her. And he's a little preoccupied at the time. And then they're not in the same room again, I don't think, until... It, well, I mean, later on in the movie. But I don't think they interact in between films. I would have to check these 75 fucking issues <laughs> that happen in between. I don't know. We were this close, but Vader's like... No, no, no. And Pal he's like, I want to Palpatine eventually is like, I'll give you a planet, whatever. Tr first planet he offers is Naboo. Yeah, I, I, I was like, hmm, that's a strange choice. He's he like, calls it his home planet. He's like, I don't give a sh fuck about Naboo. <laughs> Fuck you. You can have it. Then he's like, do you want tattooing? You can fucking glass the place. I was like, again, we were this close to him fixing the Luke Skywalker Luke. problem yeah. by accident. We would have just glassed the planet and Luke would have been killed. Right. And also Obi-Wan would have been killed. That's two birds with one stone. That's great. That's yeah, that would have been great for him. Problems. It would have actually solved all of Vader's problems. He doesn't do that because he's an emo. He has to be into suffering. Well, actually, he has a he has a pretty good reason for it. Actually, that but... would have solved three problems because technically had leia never met luke they would have never you know gone on the journey of finding out they were siblings kind of thing so like she would have never known she was related to vader or luke and she would have she would have eventually found out from bail that she was related to vader no because he would have blown her up with the death star that is true she would have been on the on alderaan and he probably would have blown her up <laughs> uh yeah because if if tattooing is already destroyed bail right. doesn't send leia to find actually Kenobi, that yeah. might have worked out better because then she, ooh, i don't know ooh. that's the star wars what there's, if we're not gonna go there's too much conversation that this could potentially go <laughs> final note for this issue is i happen to look at the creator's notes in the back oh yeah the little note did you notice how iscat's original design looked a lot like asajj ventress i did notice that and I did not like that. <laughs> I'm glad they went with something different. Yeah, I, I, because the first one, it's just too close. She actually even looks a lot like, oh, what's her name? The one Boba Fett's kind of Aura not, Singh. Aura Singh. That's You're right. thinking of Aura Singh. Yeah, because she's got the red hair in the ponytail thing. I, I, it just looks too similar. I don't love it. And I actually like Tuolan's change better because his helmet is different. But either way, I mean, if anybody can get their hands on this and look at it, it I love, first of all, I love that it's called the Empire Rights Back is a little section at the end. It's you like can little... get it. You can get it on the Marvel Unlimited app for $9.99 a <laughs> month. You can access all of these comics and also literally hundreds of comic books you can access it. on this app. Hashtag not sponsored. I just fucking love Marvel Unlimited. And you can rate it, read it like in the regular view, or you can read it in the dynamic view. It's great. I fucking love this app. I am so mad that the main Marvel app got shut down. I am super, super pissed about this. I actually haven't read a lot of the recent Star Wars comics because of it. Just because they're harder to get. Anyway, we don't have time to get into that right now. Next issue. Issue 21. 
Uh, Fortress Vader Part 3. Vader is going to Mustafar aboard the ship. With him, he has Colonel Bren, who was the person who redesigned the Jedi Temple, apparently, and also a dude named Lieutenant Rago. Vader turns off the fucking shields and descends through the atmosphere, burning the fuck out of the ship as they are landing. They land, and Vader explains, like, hey, the reason I'm actually here is he goes to the cave that he was in in the first arc, where he bled the kyber crystal. He's like, actually... This place is a locus of dark side power that I can potentially do crazy whack shit here. So we're going to build the castle here. Bren's like, okay. Vader meditates. She goes back to the ship. She comes up with the first design. She brings it to Vader. Vader's like, absolutely fucking not. Take it away. She goes back to the ship. Then she gets murdered by a guy wearing a possessed mask who designed something that looks closer to the fortress. We'll get into the details of that in a little bit. But that's basically the plot of the issue. My first note is what the actual fuck about the first page i was so the worst thing i've ever seen <laughs> i don't understand why i don't understand what <laughs> i don't understand when i don't understand how um it is the most disturbing image i've ever seen in star wars if they ever decide to do a star wars horror kind of like genre-esque film or tv show or something this needs to be included because this is fucking awful this is do you want to describe Describe what this I, thing is so it's clearly supposed to be so he sees a I, i'm assuming it's some kind of vision or he sees some kind of some kind of mir mirage thing of him it's got to be himself it's the same young anakin kind it's of young outfit. anakin jake yeah, with the anakin. Hair, right with the with the blonde hair and everything except he turns his face and it's this flesh version of Darth Vader's mask on the kid's face. <laughs> it's genuinely one of the worst things I have ever seen in my life. I thought for like a hot second this was like his personal like protocol droid or something. And he just awkwardly made it look like a young version of himself. Nope. And I was like, what is this weird? Nope, it's him thing? having a really fucked up vision because he's on this ship. Which of course Palpatine knew was going to happen. Like, Right. Which now I know is, I'm assuming, the mask doing that. Oh, uh, I think evidence. it's just the ship. Oh. I think he's just having weird fucked up visions because he's a weird fucked up dude. That's true. He could be having some kind of weird kind of flashback-y like being on the ship. I don't know if that's what it is. But... I think that's what's supposed to be going on here. Okay. We are introduced to two characters who will only be with us for this issue. And those characters are Alva Bren, who is the chief Imperial architect. I love her. She has only ever appeared in this. And her assistant, Lieutenant Rago. He has only ever appeared in this. Alva Bren is serving the most freelancer energy I have ever seen in the Star Wars in my ever. <laughs> Fucking amazing. Every line out of this woman's mouth about working with clients is incredible. She's like, whatever like, the client wants. She's like, clients, it is my job to deliver to clients things that they don't even know that they want. Right. And I'm like, yes. That is the job when you're freelancing. She draws attention. So I want to know, we've seen the mask a few times right. in this series already. It was in the background during the Jocasta New arc, and Palpatine picks it up. And remember how I noted, I said, put a pen in, Palpatine is physically touching the mask. Back in the Rule of Five. Right. I said, Palpatine's touching the mask. Keep that in mind, he is touching it with his hands. If you had read Lando, which this is kind of a prequel to first, you would have also recognized the mask from that and you would already know what the mask can do. That is the mask of Sith Lord Darth moment. It possesses people. Gotcha. And we get to the how next episode. But because the mask is now important to the story, Alva Bren is drawing attention to it. Of course. She's now setting up the mask in case you didn't notice it the way I didn't notice the second sister in the cafeteria scene in issue number 19. So Vader burns the ship on entry, like deliberately burns it up. And it doesn't outright say that he's burning it to make it a twisted imitation of himself. But I feel like that's what's going on. Yeah, he's he's like inadvertently redesigning the ship. But it's like you're just fucking up the ship, like the integrity of the ship. Are you not like I don't understand? He doesn't care. He doesn't no, the, care. The best part is where he gets out of the ship and he goes better. <laughs> well, because Bren has Bren has the sheer gall, the audacity, the nerve of this Imperial officer to go into the cockpit and be like, hey, you're going to fucking kill us all. What the fuck is going on up here? And Vader's like, I have turned off the shields. Sit down and don't talk. So he can burn the whole... I think it's meant to be that he's he's making it into a reflection of himself. Right. Because I love that she's And she line. notes it later yeah. on. 
her she's line like, is, I know his, his, his we know his aesthetic now. We know his aesthetic now. <laughs> his aesthetic is he wants he wants a fucked up little thing to match him because he's a fucked up little guy. Right. Which is great. We do get some conversation between the Mustafarians, the local inhabitants of Mustafar, which I thought was neat. And then we get an explanation for why Vader is here. It is he's looking for the cave because uh, he senses all the way back in the first arc, he was like, this place gave me that trippy force vision. Right. I bet I can do more trippy force vision stuff if I can figure out how to channel this place. And it's sort of kind of hinted at this point in the conversation he has with Palpatine that like maybe he's going to try to bring Padme back from the dead. Right. And Palpatine knows he's going to attempt to do this. Just put a pen in that for later. I went through and found a specific panel that I want to read out loud to you, Bradley. Okay. I am quoting directly from Colonel Bren here. You get clients like this from time to time. They say, oh, don't worry. I'm not particular. I'm sure whatever you design will be perfect. Cut to 10,000 revisions later, and they're still not satisfied. They, the ones who say they have no opinions, always manage to find them in the end. Uh, I mean, and I love that her response is to drink. Uh, <laughs> her response is to drink. <laughs> like, which again, he, freelancer vibes. Right, because she's like, tells her assistant, and he's like, so how can I help you with that? And she's like, well, first we'll start with tea. Then I need some brandy later. Like... <laughs> <laughs> and and when she walks back into the ship, she's like, we have officially entered the brandy phase. Right. We're going to begin drinking now. I love her so much. It is a shame she immediately gets murdered. That's why I'm mad that it was him that gets possessed and not her. Yeah, you know she's what I mean? so interesting. But it also, it makes more sense because she's the one who like shows him her design. And he's like, nah, I don't like it. And it's like, okay, so she's the designer, the architect, and then the, her assistant is the one that gets us, like, possessed and... Maybe designs. they'll explain it in later issues and I forgot. Her design's also pretty cool, by the way. Yeah. Like, her design's pretty cool. Like, I'm not it's gonna lie. It's just not practical enough. It's just not <laughs> right. Well, we will find out in later issues what Vader's actually trying to do. Gotcha. And, you know, maybe if he had told her that uh, some of this could have been avoided. But here we are. Vader and Palpatine are having a conversation. Palpatine's basically explaining about the Mask of Lord Momen. And he talks about how Lord Momen, the Sith generally would destroy. Momen was known for his desire to create which is weird. Nobody liked him. He got scrubbed from all the history books. Right. And Vader's like, well, if he got scrubbed from all the history books, then how do you know this? And Palpatine's like, the mask told me. <laughs> and just walks away. They just walked away. No, expl no further explanation. Back to the present. Rago is now wearing the mask. And Vader, like, attacks him and then realizes that Momin has designed, Momin's mask, rather, has designed what looks like closer to what fortress vader is going to look like and then the issue ends good cliffhanger by the way good cliffhanger great cliffhanger i almost read ahead i almost was kind of like i kind of want to read the rest of this right now because <laughs> i know the batshit insane stuff that's going to come in the next couple of issues right because we're going to dive into like what the fuck is going on with the mask and also why the fuck is vader on mustafar what is he really doing which we've kind of hinted at already and then issue 25 which is fucking insane i'm so glad we covered these comics this makes me so happy bradley do you have any final thoughts on fortress vader parts one two and three uh, my final thoughts are this is definitely getting somewhere like i feel like all of the work that we put in reading these other issues is finally starting to like pay off I, I really do feel like they did set up a lot of stuff um and i'm glad that they did set up I, i'm glad they sprinkled in the mask a little bit because it, it's clearly very important i love this cat's story i i can't believe for the life of me that in 2017 that they just only had these two issues with this cat really really one and it was like one and a half, really. One and um, a half. And that that was not a bigger thing. I mean, I just love that they turned a, a character that was in one or two issues and made her a really big character. It may, also made me appreciate this arc more because I already knew the character. I already knew her backstory. So watching her in this in these scenes, it's like, oh, my God, this is the final bit of her story that we're getting. And knowing her beginnings is so much more like satisfying. So I really like that they did that in the first half. And then this uh, third issue really sets up for me. I think it's setting up a better story. It's really uh, a really cool story, at least. Um, I really like that Darth Vader is back on Mustafar. And also, it kind of, I guess, 
theoretically gives explanation to why not only that he like survived on Mustafar because of his hate, but because of clearly there's some hella dark side energy on this planet. And so that's probably why he survived is because he tapped into that. My final thoughts on these first three issues are that uh, read Rise of the Red Blade by Delilah S. Dawson. It is a fucking fantastic book. And that is, yeah, it, these issues hit different. They yeah, hit a lot different, sure. especially the way Iscat is drawn. Uh, and the way that she and Twalin interact with each other. Like, I, I could hear the book in my brain as I right. read these exactly issues. like it i really recommend if you read inquisitor rise of the red blade one you should read this entire comic arc because it's really good but these two issues specifically will make you see rise of the red blade in a new light the way that rise of the red blade made people who read them initially view them in a different light and i think that's really neat so we're almost done <laughs> Next week, we're going to do Fortress Vader parts four, five, and six. We're saving part seven in the finale for its own episode. So we will be doing four, five, and six. Then we're going to do the finale and our final thoughts in the overall comic series. Then we're going to do something. I don't know if we've decided yet. We'll have to see. We, we may or may not do a final episode of the year. And then right now, as far as things are going, it looks like we will jump back on Ahsoka finally at the start of the new year. We're keeping our finger on the pulse. I will let y'all know if any of this changes. Uh, Bradley, do you have anything to plug? Yes, uh, you can go on Peacock or watch on Bravo TV uh, season 10 of Married to Medicine. I was the production coordinator on that show. So please go watch that. Awesome. And I can be also found on For Light and Dice, a Star Wars TTRPG set in the High Republic era with me and a lot of cool other creatives. You do not need to have read the High Republic. You do not even need to be familiar with Star Wars. We will explain to you everything you need to know. It's an excellent series. It is entering its second season. And this is the part where things are about to start getting crazy. Alrighty. Bradley, run the socials. Thank you for listening to Gold Squadron Gaze. Did Charles fuck something up? Send us a message at goldsquadrongaze at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter at Gold Squad Gaze. Follow us on Instagram and TikTok at Gold Squadron Gaze. Subscribe to us on YouTube at Gold Squadron Gaze, where we post the podcast as well as exclusive content. Please join us next week and every week for more of Gold Squadron Gaze. Is so it anyway, reading the books great? It's great. Doesn't it provide um, you so much fun context? I love that. I love. Aren't you glad you learned how else. to read? Um, <laughs> I feel like I'm better than everyone else. Um, <laughs> I love it so much.